Hello everybody, it's Sean Ferrick coming to you from Trek Culture and this is it already, the season finale of season two of Star Trek Lower Decks Ups and Downs. Now folks, you know what we're going to do, we're going to go through everything in this episode that we like, give it an up and we're going to go... Anyway, let's just get straight into it, first, first contact. The first thing that I want to address straight away in this episode is Titmouse animations because when I say they absolutely delivered in this episode and this season overall, they smashed it. So this is a massive up for me. This episode, I mean, the whole season has been beautiful, particularly this episode, the animation on the Cerritos, on the Archimedes, and on that explosion as well. I mean, this is, this is really, really high quality stuff. To be incredibly unfair and unrealistic for a second, you compare this with the other animated Star Trek we got, which was, of course, the animated series from the 70s, and I realize I'm being highly unfair. We've come a long way since then. But it just shows as well that with the advancements in animation technology, you can make a series that feels almost as real as any of the live action shows. You know, if you disagree with me, take a close look at the ships. Take a look at some of those asteroids in the middle of the episode. This is supreme quality stuff. Am I gushing? Yes, I am. But Titmouse Animations completely smashed it this season and overall, but especially this episode, massive, massive up from me. Our second up of the episode goes to a returning legacy character, and that is Captain Sonia Gomez, who we had last seen in Star Trek The Next Generation's second season in the episodes q -Hoo and Samaras and Snare. She'll probably be best remembered, played by returning actor Lysian Naff, as spilling her hot chocolate all over poor old Captain Picard's uniform at the beginning of Q-Who. That's something that gets referenced in this episode. She wouldn't have been someone I would have thought of to return as a character, and yet she was brilliant in the episode. Lovely to see, if you've been following Trek forever, lovely to see her progression. When we first met her as an ensign, here she is as a captain on a supremely advanced vessel, the Archimedes. And she's old friends with Captain Freeman, which, you know, makes me wonder when would Captain Freeman have been, you know, what rank would she have been back in the 2360s? This episode takes place in 2381. So I think we can confirm that Q Hood's part of the server 20, 2363, 64. So, you know, less than 20 years. That's, that's a pretty good career progression. And I love as well that we're continuing this trend of different ships get different uniforms. Because I really like the Lower Decks uniforms. And of course, I really like the grey, the Dominion War, First Contact era uniforms. Really, really enjoying that. Our next up of the episode, which is coming thick and fast here, is the Obina class ship. Now, this was inspired, of course, by the Excelsior class with a little bit of love from the Sovereign class as well. If you look at those nacelles, they're fairly, fairly Sovereign style nacelles. It has been confirmed by Mike McMahon that the Excelsior class is still operational in 2381, but the Obina would be kind of the, the next evolution on. But look at the beautiful, beautiful animation, Titmouse, thank you very much again. It's incredible. Now, I cannot wait to have a model of that just to fly around my living room. I, I leave nothing in the original packaging, guys. I'm, I'm dreadful for that. Honestly, it's one of the nicest additions to Starfleet that I've seen in a long, long time. So yes, the USS Archimedes is absolutely getting an up from me this week. We should probably discuss some story from the episode. So the Archimedes is on the way to the lap system to make first contact, and the Cerritos is there to basically fill in the role of second contact. But before they leave space dock, Freeman is reminded that, hey, she's getting a promotion, which is bittersweet news. It's fantastic for her career, but it does mean leaving the Cerritos. And of course, who overhears it, but the lovely Beckett Mariner, who's walking through the halls with a big thing of contraband, and there's Jennifer the Andorian, and there's a bit of a sniping between them, and she's like, oh, 
I bet you can't wait to rat me out, Jennifer. And she's like, I don't think about you at all, and walks away. And honestly, that's probably one of the best burns I've heard in a while. But Mariner reacts exactly the way you would expect Mariner to react. And, you know, she runs to the rest of the Lower Decks crews, and she's like, oh my god, this is happening, this is happening. While, meanwhile, Boimler is there designing his Captain Freeman Day poster, which I love. She says, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just go and tell Ransom and Shax and Spillups. So that's what she does. She runs to 10 forward. And, you know, bit of a dick move. Mariner, really? You know, basically undermining your mother. And they do not take the news very well at all. First of all, they start snapping at uh, Freeman on the bridge. And then Freeman brings them into the ready room. He's like, what's going on, guys? And yeah, Ransom, well, of course, he's just upset that he and Freeman will be leaving the Cerritos, to which she says, who says I'm bringing you? And there's, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, sorry, there's not an awful lot I can do about it. There's just this moment of this, this conversation is happening and Shax is upset and Ransom is upset and Mariner is kind of doing her Mariner thing. But Billups is just quietly looking out the window and he's not really saying anything. And then there is just that one, you know, listen, Starfleet doesn't think very much of the Cerritos and Billups snaps, getting an up from me. Billups turns around and he's like, you can, you can, you know, mess with my crew. You can mess with me, but you will not ever run down the Cerritos in the California class in front of me. He just loses the head. And Billups is a character who's really grown this season. Like, I really, really come to like Billups as chief engineer. Just in general, loved his episode overall. But also, I just continue to really like this character and I'm really enjoying the way he's being played. I, yeah, uh, I, I, I might have a slight man crush on Billups and his moustache. Tendy and Rutherford get a nice, it's development of their relationship, but it's also, you know, you get plenty of screen time with them and almost a kind of a look back on their greatest hits as well, because Tendy knows that she has to go to have a meeting with Dr. Anna, and she catches the end of a conversation which sees her name being deleted off the medical staff register. So she's understandably a bit freaked out by this. She goes to Rutherford and he's able to look through his implant and yet he sees she's not on the medical staff anymore. And he's also dealing with issues with his implant because he keeps getting warning signs coming up in the same way that I'm getting warning signs off my antivirus. I really should, really should renew that. Grant, well, let's go and, you know, if you're being transferred, let's go and do a best of tour of all of the Cerritos and we'll see all of our favorite bits. And they go into the Jeffrey's tube where they watch the Pulsar together and they confess their love for the Cerritos together. And you know, it's 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 a tender, tender storyline. And it's an up from me. This season offered us the variety of seeing each of these characters interacting with the other characters on the Cerritos. But it's also reminding us of why these two work so well together. They are, they're a perfect pairing. Now, I don't know what's coming down the line, whether they're gonna be romantically involved, or they're gonna stay platonic. It doesn't really matter to me. I just think that these two work really really well together and also thanks to them another up we find out there's a rubber ducky room on the Cerritos and we haven't been shown it yet I need to see the rubber ducky room so it's an up but it's a tease as you would have it, catastrophe happens. The Archimedes arrives in the lap system and is caught in an explosion when an unplanned solar flare explodes and planetoid that sends an awful lot of isolytic radiation out, completely knocking out the Archimedes, which then effectively becomes a comet heading towards the planet. Whoops. The Cerritos can't do an awful lot to help because Anything magnetic on the ship is going to attract the asteroids, those isolytic radiation bursts, and do the exact same to the Cerritos. So, while Mariner and Freeman are having another argument on the captain's yacht, cool to see, Rutherford and Tendi, who were hiding in there and having ice cream, burst out and go, actually, we have a plan. Remove the outer hull of the Cerritos. That's where all the problems are. That's what's going to attract this radiation. If you can get rid of that, we should be able to pilot straight through. And it's a bizarre bonkers plan that looks like it's going to work perfectly. So everyone gets donned up in their spacesuits and we go out and start removing all of the panels, which is just, it's weird in a really cool, cool way. Like, you know, we've always seen Federation ships look not the same, obviously there's all these different classes, but generally they tend to have an outer hull. So seeing the Cerritos stripped bare like this, it's really flipping cool. Now, while out on the hull, 
Billups and Rutherford have a bit of a talk because Rutherford is able to say like, oh, listen, I've got this problem. I keep getting these, uh, these warnings popping up. And Billups scans him and says, well, yeah, sure, your memory's full. You know, because remember, he's part cybernetic. So he's like, yeah, well, look, since I got my memory of Tendi erased, I've been triple saving everything. Which again, love it. Tendi and Rutherford, it's all very sweet. It's all great. And so Bill says, look, buddy, you know, it, you're going to have to delete something because if you can't save more memories, it doesn't matter whether you hold on to the last ones or not. You won't be able to access them. Rutherford has to make a choice, which he does. And he hits delete on the redundant memory files. And... We are treated to a slideshow, which I will return to in a few minutes. But what we do get is a new mystery. And this is an up from me. What's the reason behind this implant? Because we see two shadowy figures with rounded ears. Remember, it's been called a Vulcan implant, but we've got rounded ears going on, saying that, you know, they've programmed a reason for him to have the implant into the into the memory. And if anyone asks, it's fine. And then we get a fairly horrible drill right to the eye. Ugh. Rutherford's been given an implant and there's no medical reason behind it. What's going on here? Mystery, mystery, mystery. All but one of the panels are removed from the extern of the Cerritos. And actually, I just have to, I've already given the animation up, but I just have to give another up to that moment where Tendi stands on the saucer section and she looks down at those nacelles and she sees the hole floating away. I mean, that caught in my throat. That was an incredible, like, I, I, I would put that on a list of, you know, shut up and watch moments of Star Trek right now. That was stunning. Sorry, Chris, that, that's, that's an up from me. That is a massive up from me. One of the panels won't come off, but you know, the, the actual maglock itself is fused, but it's all right because there's another one, there's another one inside, so they have to travel, the four of them to... Wait, what? Guys, guys, we are, we are, we're cutting live, live to Adam Cleary right now. Well... Citation Ops has finally appeared in Star Trek. Cetacean Ops. I mean, we might have played this one close to the chest, you know? You know, like, like, almost like we were wanting this to appear, you know, almost like, like, like the other week I gave it down because I was getting anxious that it had to appear in the last episode. So I've taken that down back and it's another up because not only does it get an up for appearing in the episode in general? But it's also an up because that is a tease and a payoff. It was everything I wanted it to be. We have two beluga whales, Camino and Matt, who are just, just brilliant, dressed in the blue because of course they are. They're also kind of horny, you know, trying to get Rutherford and his broad sweaty shoulders to jump in and take a dip with them as well. Actually, on that, has this been the horniest season of Star Trek? I am loving it. Absolutely loving it because you know what, you know, Federation officers should be allowed to have a bit of fun. You know, these these whales certainly do. Oh my god, it's just like you know, you have to swim down the tank, swim and you know, hit the button, and there's this brilliant gag where like Mariner's like, well, can't they do it? Which is a fair question, you know, and they flip the lid and say, well, it wasn't designed for flippers. It was like, okay, yeah, GD Max, sorry, yeah. Uh, which, you know, in fairness, that's, that is a pretty poor decision. Why would you put something at the bottom of a cetacean tank and not make it? A anyway, 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 anyway. Yes, there's there's all this griping Mariner and everything. And eventually, Tendi just turns around and says, Mariner, will you shut up fighting with your mom? All right, go and sort that out. You know, sort of, we're your family. We'll, we'll look after this crisis. Go and have a chat with your mom, which is absolutely brilliant. And it's exactly the kind of thing that your friends and, you know, your, your family would say to you and that kind of thing. It's like, Concentrate on the important stuff, not the little stuff. So Boimler jumps in after doing a little bit of a stretch and everything, because of course he does. And, you know, <laughs> running gag for the whole episode of, hey, what are you doing for Captain Freeman Day? And, you know, I was like, isn't that for kids? Isn't that for kids? And as he's going down the tank, he's like, hey, guys, you do anything for Captain Freeman Day? And they're like, no, that's just for calves. 
Down he goes, in he goes, bum 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 bum. We're getting much closer now to the actual eye of the storm. You've got Ransom on the bridge with his joystick, manual control. Hello, Star Trek Insurrection. <gasps> Save it for station observations. And Boimler gets the thing going, tears his suit because of course he does. And you know, which is, you know, stuck underwater is as deadly as being in the vacuum of space when he can't breathe. They bring him up, he's fine. That's, that's just, we'll, 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 we, we know he was gonna be fine. Up he comes and he's grand. Okay, then we get treated to some of that beautiful animation I was telling you about. They go through this asteroid belt, ransom, fantastic piloting going on. We get, you see, they've removed the actual view screen, so there's a big hole at the front of the bridge. It's okay, they're all in spacesuits until the fact of, whoops, Mariner gets blasted out, only to be saved by Jennifer, which is Another up for me this week, that Jennifer is being bigged up. And this is kind of a, a, a lead on up for, for kind of a, how they've treated some of the secondary characters over the season, is that we've had our core characters, we've had our core main secondary characters, and then we've had so many others have been given more to do as well. And this leads to Jennifer and Mariner after the crisis has passed, as we knew it would, having a nice chat in 10 forward and be like, hey, actually, we, we kind of like each other. We're kind of buddies, you know? And we know that Jennifer and Boimler have got along with each other, you know? This is, this is what we like to see, the crews coming together. Cerritos gets through, saves the Archimedes, that's grand, goes down to the planet, Freeman, is allowed to make first contact. Because that's the nice thing about Gomez. No ego on that one. And of course she gets absolutely hammered because that's what the planet does. Reminding me very much of Cochrane and the Vulcans. Back up to the Cerritos. Everyone's having a good time. Until. Starfleet Command arrives and, you know, she goes to meet them in the observation lounge and she's like, listen, I'm not leaving the Cerritos. And they're like, you don't have a choice. And she's like, no, no, I'm turning down the promotion. And they're like, yeah, that's not why we're here. They slap her in irons because a Veruvian bomb was detonated on the Packled planet, perfect name. They have evidence that it's Freeman and some Klingon extremists that did it. We know that's nonsense, or do we? But we get a cliffhanger ending. Up from me, because I will most definitely be back for season three. You know, is it best of both worlds level? Maybe not quite, but like, is anything? Uh, brilliant, 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 totally Totally unexpected ending. Mike McMahon, fair play. You nailed that one. Now I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, but I have two additional ups right now. One, it's for season two overall. I have no hesitation in saying that this has been one of my favorite seasons of Star Trek overall. Because of 10 episodes, we had 10 solid Solid episodes. Even some of my favorite seasons from the rest of the franchise, like DS9 season four, had that episode, The Muse, wasn't great. Star Trek Voyager season four as well. Four is a good number. You know, you had, you know, random thoughts. Great to some, mm, yeah. Whereas this season, 10 episodes, and I think I bloody love them all. So for me, I, I really, really loved season two. It's an up overall from me. And of course I would be extremely remiss if I didn't give my good friend, the Kazinti, another up. Now guys, for the last time this season, join me as we travel over to Cetacean Observations. Here's my scribbles. Let's do this. We had Sonia Gomez this week, we had an Akira class model in the office on, on board the space station. We had a whole crate of Romulan ale. We had, of course, the first reference to Cetacean Ops. That came back. Captain Freeman Day slash Picard Day. We had, you know, a reference to who we get stuck with. Some weirdo with a riding crop. Boom, you better believe they're talking about Captain Styles from Star Trek Three. Reference to Sonia Gomez spilling the hot chocolate on Captain Picard when she says she's made a bigger fool of herself in front of much more intimidating captains. <laughs> Freeman saying, I was just trying to avoid conflict, basically echoing the writing rules of the first couple of seasons of The Next Generation. The explosion to me really reminded me of the Praxis explosion radiolytic isotopes, which had previously appeared in the Enterprise episode, The Catwalk. We know that they are absolutely deadly to humans, Vulcans, and Denobulans. 
and they reappear here. We had the captain's yacht appeared. We had Mariner calling herself a Kirk-style free spirit. The Maglocks on all of the uh, bits of this hull are all first contact style Maglocks. We had Billups' way of swearing to say, ah, dragon's blood. We had the joystick, which is manual control. Of course, we saw in Star Trek Insurrection before. Boimler comes back from his near drowning and says, I saw a koala? And then he just goes, yeah, I would just keep that to yourself. In the flashes, when Rutherford is going through his memory files, we see Rutherford and Tendi connected via a Chinese finger trap, which we had seen Data trapped in before in The Next Generation. We had also seen them doing a live drawing class with a fairly nude Commander Ransom, which is evocative of when Data was critiquing Picard's nude drawing, and of course, when the Doctor was doing a painting of Seven of Nine. Toward the end of the episode, when the crisis is averted, we have a couple of other starships show up. We have a Nova class ship, like the USS Equal, we have an Oberth class ship like the Grissom and the Pegasus and we also have a Parliament class ship like the Vancouver and what appears to be if you look closely just underneath the Oberth class a refit of the Antares class ship from the original series. The Bajoran patient who every single time you cut to medical he seems to be sitting there on the bio bed and they make a joke out of it and Tendi's like ah you're fine. You know Tendi's got to be bumped up to command crew science like Jadzia Dax and of course Tana's like who the hell is that I don't know who that is he'll be like Spock. I felt Freeman turning down the promotion was very evocative of Riker continually turning down promotions as well. That poor, embarrassing guard of honour at the end, you know, things like when Neelix was leaving Voyager or when Worf was leaving the Enterprise, you had everyone lined up on all the sides. Nice idea. Didn't really, didn't really work out too well. Before I go, I have one last up to give out. And that is to Chris Westlake the composer of the music for Star Trek Lower Decks. To say that I have enjoyed the score for Star Trek Lower Decks is not doing it justice. It is among the best Star Trek music that there is commercially available, and I am not exaggerating when I say that. The soundtrack was only recently dropped. Have a listen through. You will hear quite the variety of music, and it's just, it's perfect for what we're getting on screen, and he has absolutely just designed a beautiful soundscape to go along with Lower Decks. And that is everything for Cetacean Observations. Folks, that is everything for this episode and for indeed this season of Star Trek Lower Decks. I want to say thank you so much for joining us for these 10 episodes. We will be back next week with Star Trek Prodigy. If you reckon I missed anything in this episode, which is incredibly possible, please drop it into the comments below. Please guys, as you know I'm gonna say, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Every time you do that, you are helping to boost this channel, which means we get to bring more content to you. I have been Sean Ferrick. You can catch me over on Twitter and all the usual socials at Sean Ferrick. You can catch Trek Culture on Twitter at Trek Culture. You look after yourself until I see you next time. I am incredibly interested to hear what you thought of Lower Decks overall. Let us know. You look after yourselves, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, live long and prosper.